August 3rd, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Esther chapters 9 and 10 from the Old Testament. In the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar, on its thirteenth day, the edict of the king and his law were to be executed. It was on this day that the enemies of the Jews had supposed that they would gain power over them. But contrary to expectations, the Jews gained power over their enemies. The Jews assembled themselves in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to strike out against those who were seeking their harm. No one was able to stand before them, for dread of them fell on all the peoples. All the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and those who performed the king's business were assisting the Jews, for the dread of Mordecai had fallen on them. Mordecai was of high rank in the king's palace, and word about him was spreading throughout all the provinces. His influence continued to become greater and greater. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, bringing death and destruction, and they did as they pleased with their enemies. In Susa, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. In addition, they also killed Parshan Datha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Eridatha, Parmashta, Arasai, Aridai, and Visatha, the ten sons of Haman, son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not confiscate their property. On that same day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was brought to the king's attention. Then the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed five hundred men and the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? What is your request? It shall be given to you. What other petition do you have? It shall be done. Esther replied, If the king is so inclined, let the Jews who are in Susa be permitted to act tomorrow, also according to today's law and let them hang the ten sons of Haman on the gallows. So the king issued orders for this to be done. A law was passed in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa then assembled on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar, and they killed three hundred men in Susa, but they did not confiscate their property. The rest of the Jews who were throughout the provinces of the king assembled in order to stand up for themselves and to have rest from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of their adversaries, but they did not confiscate their property. All of this happened on the 13th day of the month of Adar. They then rested on the 14th day and made it a day for banqueting and happiness. But the Jews who were in Susa assembled on the 13th and 14th days and rested on the 15th making it a day for banqueting and happiness. This is why the Jews who are in the rural country, those who live in rural cities, set aside the 14th day of the month of Adar as a holiday for happiness, banqueting, holiday, and sending gifts to one another. Mordecai wrote these matters down and sent letters to all the Jews who were throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, to have them observe the fourteenth and the fifteenth day of the month of Adar each year, as a time when the Jews gave themselves rest from their enemies, the month when their trouble was turned to happiness in their mourning to a holiday. These were to be days of banqueting, happiness, sending gifts to one another, and providing for the poor. So the Jews committed themselves to continue what they had begun to do, and to what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the enemy of all the Jews, had devised plans against the Jews to destroy them. He had cast Pur, that is, the lot, in order to afflict and destroy them. But when the matter came to the king's attention, the king gave written orders that Haman's evil intentions that he had devised against the Jews should fall on his own head. He and his sons were hanged on the gallows. For this reason, these days are known as Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore, because of the account found in this letter, and what they had faced in this regard, and what had happened to them, 
the Jews established as binding on themselves, their descendants, and all who joined their company, that they should observe these two days without fail, just as written and at the appropriate time, on an annual basis. These days were to be remembered and to be celebrated in every generation, and in every family, every province, and every city. The Jews were not to fail to observe these days of Purim. The remembrance of them was not to cease among their descendants. So Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm the second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews in the 127 provinces of the empire of Ahasuerus, words of true peace, to establish these days of Purim in their proper times, just as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had established, and just as they had established both for themselves and their descendants, matters pertaining to fasting and lamentation. Esther's command established these matters of Purim, and the matter was officially recorded. King Ahasuerus then imposed forced labor on the land and on the coastlands of the sea. Now all the actions carried out under his authority and his great achievements, along with an exact statement concerning the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king promoted, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? Mordecai the Jew was second only to King Ahasuerus. He was the highest ranking Jew and he was admired by his numerous relatives. He worked enthusiastically for the good of his people and was an advocate for the welfare of all his descendants. God, I think we forget how important your timing is. The story of Esther took place over 10 years. Of course, the highlights are featured in this great chapter, or sorry, great book in the Bible. And we can see your sovereignty and all of the pieces that you maneuvered to make sure that the outcome happened the way it did. But if we really look at this story, we are seeing the highlights. Almost like what you watch on the news day after Sunday for the football highlights. What about all those times in between? What about all those times of doubt and fear and confusion and anxiety and worry? What do we do with those, God? To have faith like Mordecai did, where he knew that you would take care of them. To have faith like Queen Esther, who was willing to die for what she believed in. And even, to a certain extent, to have faith like the king who granted all of these things to happen. Granted, it was by your, ha by your hand. But I think about my own life, and, and these things happen in our lives that seem so traumatic and so dramatic at the moment. And they seem to consume us with worry and anxiety and fear. And really, we're just fearful that the outcome is not going to be what we want it to be. Again, we're back to choosing our will over your will. The first time Queen Esther had to go into court with the complete fear that the king could have told them to kill her right then and there, there was no fear or worry or anxiety. There was just complete trust in you, God. And yet here I sit with situations happening in my life that are nowhere close to death, <laughs> per se. And my heart is troubled and I'm filled with worry and fear and anxiety that it won't turn out the way I want it to. And I know all those verses. I know all of the things that you tell us to trust in you, believe in you, you'll take care of us, you love us. How could I not take care of you? I created you. God, I know those verses. I know a lot of them by heart. But how do I get them from my head knowledge down to my heart knowledge so that these times where the in-between of the 10 years and the highlights of you maneuvering in our lives and doing what is best for us, 
how do I get out of this incredible valley to the next plateau so I can see the next plateau? And when I'm in the valley, how do I have faith that I'm going to make it to the next plateau so I can see the next one? God, I know that the only way that we can do this, the only way we can deal with life, the only way we can deal with hurt and disappointment and betrayal, trust, anxiety, fear, worry, the only way we can deal with it is with you. With you by our side, constantly praying, constantly in your word, constantly surrounded by people who will tell you the truth and keep you in line with your word. God, my life has become very transparent, these, especially these last few years. And I want to keep it that way. It doesn't mean that I do life right. It means I mess up a lot. But I don't ever want to hide my honesty and humanness of things I deal with. I don't ever want to hide in sin. I know that you can see all of it, but I want other people to see all of it. Because in my weakness, they see your strength. They see you walk alongside of me. They see you do things for me. It's not because of me certainly not because of my faith that is weak it is because of you and your strength and in those times of weakness just as Paul talks about in those times of weakness that I have which is a lot you shine so big not not just in my life but to other people who watch my life And even though I don't like my weaknesses and I work on my weaknesses. If my humanness brings you glory. Then I'm not really sure how much more I can ask for. I know we are all unsure at times. We all get scared at times. We all worry at times. Even though you command us not to. God, I just pray that those times will continue to be shorter and shorter as we learn to rely on you more and more and seek your will more and more and start to connect the dots that you love us so much that you are fully aware of the situation we're going through and you want better for us. You don't want us stuck in that situation. You don't want us to stay in that situation. You want the best for us. And you always want the best for us. Not once do you ever wish ill will upon us. It's so hard to understand with the world we live in and the people we deal with who are not like that. But God, help me connect my head knowledge to what my heart needs to know so I can live a life that reflects your glory that reflects your love that reflects your forgiveness allow me to have at least a smidgen of those traits that you have so I can share them with other people and I thank you for the strength that you give us during these times when we're in these valleys the strengths we need to learn what we need to do and climb to the next plateau so we can see the next plateau. In your son's name I pray. Amen.